So the standard is really great in addressing lots of common challenges um, that women, trans men, non-binary people can experience um, in the workplace um, whilst menstruating or going through menopause. Um, so for instance, there is guidance on things such as making the workplace more comfortable um, around kind of lighting or um, seating. Um, there's also um, advice in the standard about how to create a really kind of inclusive um, and supportive workplace environment. Um, and there's kind of other adjustments are in there that would be really supportive. Like, so things like, you know, providing uniforms that are comfortable or um, making sure that um, employees can, um, well, if it's possible, work from home when they're not feeling well um, and things like that. Or even just simple things like having access to hot drinks. Well, I think what's been so fantastic about this standard is that it's really opened up conversations around menstruation and menopause in the workplace um, via the media. So there was lots of fantastic coverage about the standard, um, which I heard is unprecedented um, for standards, um, such as on Sky News and BBC. And I've also spoken about it myself um, on the radio too. Um, but as well, there's some gu guidance in that will specifically help kind of create open and inclusive conversations about menstruation and menopause. So things like um, having a menopause or kind of menstrual health champion who is trained um, in diversity and inclusion. Um, and there's some amazing guidance in there about, you know, how menstruation and menopause are very kind of individual experiences. And it's important to understand individual employees' needs. So there's a fantastic table in there that talks about um, lots of different aspects of identity that can affect someone's menstrual menopausal experience. So these can be things like ethnicity, sexuality, age, um, socioeconomic background, for example. I think there's many ways in which the standard can promote inclusivity in the workplace. Um, so for instance, it has very tailored advice in there for particular types of job roles, whether they're outdoor roles or whether they're um, roles in offices or, um, and as well, there's specific guidance for um, HR managers, um, people who are in various different senior roles in the company, um, for menopause and um, menstruation ambassadors as well. And there's also even specific advice for smaller companies that may not have the resources um, to implement lots of different policies. Um, but I think what I think is really, one of the things I think is really fantastic about this guidance is the inclusive language that it uses. I mean, it not only highlights that there's been traditionally discrimination in the workplace for women, um, but it also includes transgender men and non-binary people too, who've had similar experiences around menstruation and menopause. So it's fantastic that it includes lots of different people. And as well, there's this really great uh, table in there that's useful that shows kind of how menstruation and menopause are really individual experiences that can be impacted by um, aspects of people's identity, like their ethnicity, age, sexuality, um, and economic status as well. The media has already had, well social media in particular, has already had quite a positive impact um, on knowledge and perceptions of menstruation and menstrual health. So I've done research in schools um, with young people aged 16 to 19 and they've told me that they, these were boys and girls and non-binary students too. And they said to me, they've seen quite a lot on social media about periods, whether it's just in a meme or it's a TikToker who's talking about their menstrual experience. Um, and for them, this has really opened up not only online conversations about menstruation, but offline conversations too. Like some of the girls I spoke to said that they deliberately talked about periods in front of boys to try to normalize it. The boys said to me that they wanted to be able to talk more about periods and they'd seen things on social media like footballers talking about period poverty. Um, so from that perspective, we see that social media is already having an impact on discourses around menstruation. Um, and as well, um, there's been a lot more coverage about the menopause too over the past few years. And I've seen this really open up online and offline conversations about both topics. So it'll be really exciting to see where things go from here. I've already seen like changes over the media in the past kind of few years um, and more kind of positive and accurate and informative representations of menstruation and menopause. 
um, particularly since um, the year of the period, and as uh, our magazines called it in 2015, when suddenly all this menstrual activism became visible on social media, like people like, for example, Kieran Gandhi, who ran the London Marathon on her period, what's free, ble free bleeding, for example. Um, and I have seen a lot more in the media recently, of course, partly um, due to the British standard, but also thanks to organisations like Bloody Good Period about um, people's experiences of menstruation in the workplace and how it can have an impact. And one thing that's been really fantastic to see as well has been the increasing coverage and um, advancements that have been made in endometriosis research too. And I think it's really great that the standard as well is raising the awareness of menstrual health conditions like endometriosis, premenstrual dysphoric disorder and polycystic ovaries. And I'm really hoping this could even need to more research in those areas too.